Hello and welcome back to My Own Worst Enemy. We are going to go through the command phase and the organization phase in Rebel Fury here. If you recall, I did turn number one, which skipped those phases, and I just wanted to start turn two, go through those two phases so you could see what basically constitutes a complete turn of Rebel Fury. And I decided I'm not going to play this one out. What I might do in the future at some point is play another scenario, the complete scenario, but for now, I just want to make sure that you get a complete turn in to see how it feels and what you need to go through to conduct a turn. So kind of just a tutorial here. And I will say that I really enjoyed this game and I've already pre-ordered The Army of the Potomac, which is the second volume in this series. I like it that much and I think this is a great game. And I highly recommend you check this one out and take a look at the other one that's coming up as well. It's on the P500. You get a discount if you order it now, so keep that in mind. But let's go ahead and start. So I, I've got the rule book here. We are going to start with 4.0. That is the command phase. And the first thing that we do is the initiative. And so we, we're in turn two now. So it says starting on turn two or three in a turning movement scenario, each side is going to total the number of battle stars on their HQs, which are on the map. The side with the greater number of battle stars is going to be the first player. So if we had our HQs are here's Rosecrans and here's Bragg. And in this case, they each have one battle star. So they're going to be tied. But if Bragg had two battle stars, let's say, not that he would. I don't think Bragg should even have one. <laughs> let's not comment on the quality of Civil War generals, I guess. But anyway, if Bragg had two and Rosecrans had one, then Bragg would be the one to go first and there would be no need to break the tie as we're going to have to do here. It says in the case of ties such as zero or one in our case, each player is going to roll one die until one player has rolled higher. So basically you're going to roll your 2d10s here and whoever has the greater number on the d10 is going to win. And if there's a tie on the dice, you're going to re-roll those. So let's see who's going to have the initiative here. So we're going to roll these 2d10s. And Bragg, who I talked poorly about, won the initiative. Oh, no, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. It's, uh, there's so many games that take a zero on a D10 as a 10, or it's either a zero or a 10. In Rebel Fury, a zero is just that. It's a zero. So in this case, Bragg would definitely have the initiative. So the Confederate player would be the side to go first in this turn. And once that's complete, we'll move on to 4.2, the HQ redeployment check step. And the way that's going to work is, and again, this is all in the rule book. We're going to check each of our H HQs to make sure, or to tell rather, which current mode they're in. And that will determine what happens to them. So starting with, with 4.21, HQs that are in maneuver mode are completely removed from the map. So in this case, if we had uh, Bragg is in his battle mode, you remember the movement, the maneuver mode, is in that side where they have the greater range, the 12 in this case for Bragg. So right now, both of these units are in battle mode. So there's no need to remove them from the map yet. We go to the next step, and this is where if the HQs have one of these markers, uh, one of these markers on them, HQs in battle mode, which we both have in battle mode, with a battle mode auto marker on it, well, they don't have that then you would remove them. So let's go to the next step. HQ's in battle mode with a battle mode plus two marker on it. And in this case, you would have to make a die roll to see if they come off. And this, again, these markers are not on our HQ's right now, which brings us to the final one, which our, our, our HQ's are in battle mode and there are no markers on them. So the HQ must make a removal die roll. We're gonna roll a D10 and we're gonna add the number of battle stars and again, each of our generals here have one battle star, or each of our HQs. I'm not going to say general because, again, you're, these are not generals on the map. They're just HQ markers. So each one has one. So they'll each get one added to this die roll. So it says to add the number of battle stars, roll, add that one in our case to it, and look up the result on the HQ removal check table, which is printed here in the rules. It's also printed on the player aid card conveniently for us. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll start with the Union. So we're gonna start with Rosecrans up here. I'll grab the D10 and we're gonna roll on this table and we're gonna add one to whatever this roll is. So we roll, we get an eight plus one is nine. So it says five or greater. The HQ is removed from the map and you also remove the marker 
this marker would also be removed at the same time. So Rosecrans comes off the map for now. And let's roll for Bragg. We'll use his gray Confederate D10 here. So we're gonna roll two plus one is three. So four or less, the HQ must remain in battle mode in the same hex for this entire game turn. And of course it says if the HQ has a battle mode of plus two, you'd flip it to its auto size, or otherwise you would place a plus two marker on it. So in this case, Bragg is gonna be stuck here for this next turn, turn two. Now what that means is Rosecrans, and we'll see in just a second here, is, is gonna be able to relocate his HQ to somewhere a little more where he would want it to be, where Bragg is kind of stuck here. And again, if you remember the command range now, he's gonna to have to, all these units are gonna to have to want to kind of converge where Bragg is. So it's not a good thing for Bragg, but it is a good thing for the Union. So once you do that, and now you know where the HQs are, so we've got Rosecrans off the map, Bragg on the map, you go into 4.3, which is the HQ redeployment step. So starting with the first player, and in this case, it is the Confederates, each player must place all HQs that were removed in the step above or are arriving as reinforcements, which you remember we have some coming in in later turns, but they're not here yet. Each HQ may be placed in either maneuver or battle mode. There are some limitations as to where you can place these. Cannot be placed in a hex containing an enemy's zone of control or zone of influence. Cannot be placed in a hex with an, that already contains an HQ. And it must be placed within three hexes of a friendly unit, divisions or detachments. It may be placed in a hex with, friend, with a friendly unit. It must be placed closer, not the same distance to a friendly unit, than it is to uh, enemy units. And then it says in the unlikely event that an HQ has no associated units on the map, then you would place it in an empty hex on the map within three hexes of a friendly entry hex. So what that means is we're gonna take, uh, we'll do nothing for Brad, because remember he's already on the map, he couldn't move or he's not gonna move. And then uh, we're gonna take Rosecrans and place him on the map. But before we place Rosecrans, and I'm sure some of you are screaming at the monitor right now that you're looking at. Yeah, I need to go ahead and place, I forgot to do this, but I need to go ahead and place the, the battle mode, that plus two DRM to brag. So you would place this because he's stuck in place. He would now earn one of these battle mode plus two DRM markers. So we'd put him there and give him that. Okay, with that done, now we are able to place the uh, Union HQ. And I'm not gonna put a lot of thought in this because like I said, I'm not really gonna play out this the second turn. I, what I am gonna do, and this is one of the cool things about this game, at least I think it's cool. What I am gonna do is there's so few counters on this, this map and it's such a counters light game. What I will do is I'll take pictures of what's on the board so that I can come back at any time and set this exact same battle back up. So if you guys do really wanna see a playthrough of turn two as is here, I will have on record the setup of this board and I'll just set it right back up and we'll keep going. So I definitely will do that. So let's go ahead and place um, Rosecrans. I'm just gonna put him down here in Brock's farm. So what that's saying is, that, remember this is your command intent so what I'm saying is I want the center of gravity for the army to kind of converge on the Rosecrans HQ. Brock Farm is where I want these units to kind of move towards with being that the bulk of the Confederates are right now at least. Remember, there's a lot of units that are still off board that will come back in turn three. And so the bulk of the army though right now for the Confederates is over here. So I'm kind of telling these units to converge this way. And that's why we're going to put them there. So the next thing we would do is the detachment placement step. So it says starting with each, uh, starting with the first player, again, uh, Bragg won the initiative here. 4.4, the detachment placement step. So in this particular scenario, the Union set up with three detachments available. The Confederates had two detachments available. So there are again limitations as to where these detachments can go. And it's cannot be placed in a, it's obvious stuff really, cannot be placed in a hex containing an enemy zone of control, zone of influence or enemy unit, cannot be placed in a hex that already has a detachment, cannot be placed in an enemy entry hex, which that's, <laughs> why somebody would do that or try want to do that, may be placed in a hex with a friendly HQ and or division, may be placed in an unoccupied entrenchment or fort if not in an enemy zone of control or zone of influence. And of course the HQ must trace a path from its hex to uh, the detachment's placement hex. And it cannot, that path cannot pass through enemy zones of controls, influence, or even a unit. The path can be no longer than the HQ's command range. So you'll note that when I put Rosecrans down, I didn't mention it, I put him down in maneuver mode. So his command range is 12. And that's, you know, if you wanna put these detachments down, 
then you're going to want those inside the command range. So we've got three detachments here off board. I'm going to grab them. This is where we're going to deploy these. So I'd like to put one. So Rosecrans is here. I'd like to put one over here at Pond Spring. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so that's well within his command range. So we could put a detachment over here. And then there's another detachment that I would like to put. And of course, uh, this area is well within inside Rosecrans's command range. So we'd probably want to put another one. And I can put one here with McCook. Let's just do that. So we'll say this detachment's going to go under McCook here. So we're really guarding this bridge over here. So we've got these Confederates trapped over here. Uh, then one final detachment. We could put this one... Maybe here at Jay's Mill. Let's see. Well, no, well, Bragg is here. I don't think the, the HQs have zones of control or zone of influence. There's a unit here and a unit here, but they, the zone of influence doesn't reach Jay's Mill. So we could put this, I believe, right here at Jay's Mill. Keep the Confederates from coming across that bridge. At least slow them down some. So the next thing we would do is 4.5 detachment recalls. Well, wait a minute. I did not finish placing detachments. I'm getting ahead of myself here. We want to grab the two Confederate ones. So here, Bragg is limited to his command range of five. Uh, you can see the five there for Bragg. So we'd, we'd have to put these detachments with those same rules around Bragg, but a lot tighter in here. So we could, let's see, it's gonna be a lot harder because the, the union has these units that are gonna create a problem for placement. So we could put the first one, we could put it back here if the intent is to maybe get these units to come back and around. And then we can place the other detachment. We could put it here at uh, this mill and again, I'm not really putting a lot of thought into this. Uh, can I do that one, two? Yes, that would work there. Not putting a lot of thought into it because I don't, I'm not really sure I'll finish this game. So now we go to the detachment recall step, starting with the first player, the Confederates. We can remove all, some, all, or none of the detachments. And even if I just put them down, I could pick those right back up in this step. But I'm not going to do that. Nobody, we just placed them. Nobody's going to recall any of their detachments. You could, for example, like there's a detachment over here for the Union side sitting in Chattanooga. And this is where I could pick this up and then next turn place it somewhere different if I would like to. I'm not going to do that. Now we're going to do off movement. The off movement step, this is not in this scenario, but some scenarios use the, the off map board and that's where we would conduct that movement. So we are not going to do that. That's going to end the command phase, which will take us now into the organization phase. And the first thing there, of course, is 5.1, the Formation determination step. And this says that starting with the uh, first player, in this case, Bragg, the Confederates again have the initiative. Each division that is in battle formation and not in an enemy zone of control, zone of influence, can be flipped to maneuver formation. This is important, and they tell you here the only time during a turn that a division can change from battle to maneuver is now. So you want to make sure if you have any units you really want to move somewhere different. This is where you're going to flip them from their battle formations back into maneuver mode. And it also says that as you are checking each division, just to make sure that each division in an enemy zone of control is actually in battle formation. It, it should be. You should already have these in battle formation, but it says it never hurts to check because if you're like me, you'll forget these things sometimes. And there's an extra play note down here that states what I just said. If a, if a division's in battle formation, and you do not put it into maneuver formation here, it's gonna stay in battle formation for the remainder of this turn. So starting with this side for the Confederates, uh, these units cannot change into maneuver formation because they are in the zone of influence of Steedman here. So they are stuck in battle formation. So now I'm just gonna move along and we will, so who is this, Pegram? This is Forest Cavalry. That one's not gonna matter. We have Buckner here. Stewart. So this unit is in the uh, zone of influence of Wilder. He can't flip. This Liddell unit is not in the zone of control or the zone of influence of any Union unit. So I'm just going to flip this one to its maneuver formation because we may want to swing that unit around somewhere else. Uh, over here, this is, um, who is that? Gist, it looks like. So it, again, in the zone of influence of Van Cleve. So I can't flip that one. 
Preston back here though is not, so we're gonna flip him into his maneuver formation. And again, you want to do this, and I would think you'd wanna do it even if you don't plan on moving the unit, but you wanna do that to make sure you can move the unit. These two are in the zone of influence of Reynolds and therefore they will not be able to flip. So only a couple of units there for the Confederates were, were able to flip. The Union now, we'll start back over here. Steedman cannot flip, he's in the zone of influence of these. Uh, McCook here though is not in the zone of influence of any Confederate unit. And who's below him there? We just put a detachment down. So we'd wanna flip McCook. He can flip. So now he's in maneuver mode. Uh, Brannon here is also able to flip. So he's gonna go back into maneuver mode. Uh, Wilder cannot, he's in the zone of influence of Stewart. Van Cleve cannot, he's in the zone of control of Gist. Uh, Negley up here can, so we'll, we'll flip him. Wood is also able to flip into maneuver mode. Baird is also able to flip. Reynolds cannot, but however, the remainder of all these units can flip into maneuver mode, and we would definitely want to do that. Like I said, you want to have these units, even if you don't intend on moving them right now, you might change your mind and decide you really do want to move them. And then Davis finally can also flip back into maneuver mode as he is outside the zone of control or zone of influence of those units. Really neat thing about this game, it's, it's, I really like the way this works. You know, your, your units that aren't engaged with another unit you're able to, sh to shuffle around, shift around to into a better position. Not all of them as we saw, but you can do some of them that way. So that's pretty cool. The next thing we would do is go into 5.2, the blown division return step. And this is where the units that were pushed out onto the, uh, the mark, the, the player's aid card here, they would be able to now come back onto the map. We won't see that this turn. They will be able to do that on the next turn as there are some blown units at the turn three mark. Then finally, we have this disengagement step, and that says, uh, starting with the first player, the initiative player, you can conduct voluntary retreats. You alternate choosing friendly divisions in an enemy zone of control and have it conduct a retreat. And then once the player passes, they cannot retreat any further divisions. Then their opponent may retreat up to three more divisions. This is how a surrounded division can extricate itself, but it's not a free lunch because if you go through the, the retreat procedure, uh, there's some things that happen. In this case, no one's going to retreat. Everybody is pretty much where they want to be, so I'm not going to conduct retreat. And that's going to end the organization phase, 5.0. And now we're back into that movement phase, and this is where we started turn number one. So if I were going to do turn number two now, I would keep going, and we would now move these units like we did each, you know, one player would move a unit, the other player would move a unit, until you have the passing, and then we go back into the battle, and then it all goes over and over again. So I am gonna stop it here. I wanted you to see how the, uh, the organization phase worked, how the command phase worked, so that you get an idea of what you should be doing. I will, like I said, I'm gonna take a picture as is of this scenario. I do have other stuff I wanna set up on this table. So I will preserve the setup. And again, that is a really neat thing about Rebel Fury is there's so few units that if you wanted to stop at a point in a game, it's just easy to snap a couple of pictures with your phone and come back and just set it back up setup would be a breeze to, to this particular scenario to do it again. All right, so we will stop it here. Again, I really like this game. I think Mark Herman is, the design here is fantastic. I don't need to say that. Everybody knows Mark Herman's fantastic in his designs. So, uh, and actually Mark Herman, I, I, I pre-ordered your book on, um, it's also on the P500 and hopefully I'm looking forward to reading that. I think that's gonna be an awesome read. So as always, if you like this video, please, I ask that you give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you have not. And if you really wanna help the channel, consider becoming a patron and that's gonna allow me to get some better equipment for this channel, hopefully. And who knows, maybe a game or two. As always, thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you back here next time.